Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 7. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California, our seventh SuperCloud. Dave Vellante, Rob Stretcher, the Cube Collective, the whole gang is here. And we got Dipti Barkar here, the general manager and vice president of Azure Data. And of course, Sanji Mohan, industry analyst with the Cube Collective. He's on his own with Sanji Mohan, great analyst. Call him, check him out. He's got great stuff. Sanji, great to see you. Dipti, good to see Thank you. Thank you. Both Cube alumni, Cube Collective member. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me back here. I got to say, Sanji, everyone that I talk to, I love Sanji. You're really. <laughs> One of the best, I, if not the best data analysts in the industry. You've I, earned it over the years and, and props to you. Thank you so much. It really means a lot. Dipti, you're two years in the Microsoft, former entrepreneur, sold your company in Microsoft. Things are good over there. I mean, the culture, very entrepreneurial, Satya in charge. They got open AI, got a lot of good action going on over there. Microsoft's doing pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for be, uh, having me uh, over again. Uh, great to have this conversation. Uh, minor correction there, another company acquired it, but great to complete two years in Microsoft. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, excited to talk about data, AI, and uh, uh, open source. So one of the things why I'm excited about this event, SuperCloud, is because it's the confluence of cloud scale meets the data market, meaning mm -hmm. there's a platform shift happening. We heard Jensen Wong at NV, so it's platform shift, certainly at the infrastructure, chips, that's mm -hmm. playing out. And every day it's getting faster, cheaper, stronger performance. The next wave that's going to be coming fast is the innovation and the disruption to, in an industry disruption, the data layer and this or the DEX data platform. And you know, if five years ago, if you were talking about open data formats or governance, you were either a data nerd <laughs> or you were like change the channel or fall asleep. Because it was kind of boring. It was kind of in the weeds, kind of like data warehouse. Now it's the most important conversation. This seems to be hot. And Everyone always asks me this question, so I want to ask you guys the question. Why is it important? Why is everyone talking about what looks like to be very boring stuff? Now, what would you say to that? If I may say, uh, Go for it. data has never been boring. We just, <laughs> the, in the past, data was sort of guarded with so much zeal and fervor that it, it, you know, the, we made it boring. We, it was a very defensive thing. Now data has gone on, on offensive because the more data you have, the more power to you, the more competitive advantage you have. So that the, there's been a mind shift in how data is yeah. looked at. Yeah, uh, well, plus the career paths. Yeah. If you were getting a computer science degree, a compiler, OS, or database in the 80s when I was there, well, I took the database track because I like data, but I mean, it wasn't mainstream, it was very yeah. niche. -y. Very niche, -y, and, and yes. I don't mean to say it's boring, but it is kind of boring to the mainstream, yeah. but now it's not mainstream, and now it's mainstream. Absolutely. This is where the action, computer science, all the top brains are working on this. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I've been in data for 20 years, I would say it's been, <laughs> it's been very interesting. Um, but for sure, uh, I think that it's evolved, right? Uh, it's evolved from the time of uh, being closed, and it's now open, and that's actually an advantage for customers. Uh, at the end of the day, customers want interop across a variety of systems. That's why the value of uh, open, uh, you know, you asked why is it suddenly so hot? Um, these data formats and table formats on top of the file formats um, essentially give our customers a choice. Uh, and uh, no longer are they locked into walled gardens, it's, it's opened up, which, which means that they can have uh, computes that they can uh, uh, choose on top as well. Uh, multiple different computes can run on these uh, formats, uh, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, and that's a great value to customers, which means they can do more with their data. At the end of the day, um, data is only as valuable as you what you make yeah. with it. Right? You know, Ali Godsey said at the Databricks AI Plus Data Summit on stage, and this question got pulled off the, the cutting room floor because on the survey, I wish we had it in there. But we want to get reaction to it. I want to get your reaction. He said, don't give your data to any vendor and let them lock you in, including Databricks. <laughs> so he was proactively saying, yeah. yes. make your data available and heterogeneous mm -hmm. in a heterogeneous environment. What does he mean by that? Because he's not saying don't give it to Databricks. What, what he's meaning, he's kind of saying go open. Absolutely. What, explain um, that. Yeah, and you know, with, with Microsoft as well, uh, with Microsoft Fabric in particular, we've made a choice to move from uh, our closed source uh, format to pure open formats. And it was a pretty big change. Uh, it's a pretty uh, dramatic change for us to move all our engines to re-engineer these 
uh, computes to now read these native formats, right? Um, and the reason that uh, you know open data, as I mentioned, these formats, whether it's Delta Lake or Iceberg, and you know we uh, we support Delta Lake and Iceberg is uh, uh, landing very soon. Um, it, the reasons that these are important, again, customers get a choice. They could run a variety of engines on the top, uh, and of course, interrupt between platforms as well. They can use Microsoft Fabric. Uh, we hope they do. Uh, but if you are using, uh, uh, you know, running some AI with Databricks or with uh, a snowflake, you can interrupt. Uh, we, are, we have a layer with one lake that supports these open formats, uh, which allow customers to interrupt. So in that, you're not locked in. You can do more with your data. You don't have to move it around. You can actually leave it in place, uh, uh, reduce your cost, and, and okay, get so value. I, I have to ask you, because everyone's saying, oh yeah, you can run your data anywhere. <laughs> it's like a credit card. You got to read the fine print, Sanjeev. So there are some instances where you can only read, not yeah. write. Explain, because this is very nuanced. Explain what all this means, because customers I talk to are like, oh no, we have this and we can read and write. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. And some are less performant than others. Right. So you have yeah. engines and you have formats. Right. Explain the, the nuance between reading and writing in an open way. So in, in the open, there are three main open formats, Iceberg and Delta are the two main ones, and then there's Hoodie. All three of them have their own specific, particular way of writing data. And they were all built for different use cases, right? I mean, Hoodie was built for streaming in Jest. Uh, and then Iceberg was, was actually, even to this day, does not support streaming in Jest. So, so when you write in a particular table format, that becomes your primary format. The read only is, the compatibility is only at read-only level because it is not possible for you to write some piece of data into Delta and say, now go make copies into other uh, formats because the latency would be too high. And then you lose all that atomicity and transactionalness if you are waiting for all the three. So, so that is, so the, the fine print that you mentioned is so important. Anytime anyone says, this is open source, this is compatible, you really have to take it to the next level of detail to understand what is open source, what is compatible. So. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I would say, you know, if you go back in history and you look at just databases, mm -hmm. uh, SQL Server, state-of-the-art uh, database, uh, other databases out there support advanced transactionality, right? A lot of other features uh, that uh, some of the workloads need. Mm -hmm. uh, compute mm -hmm. engines today with uh, open formats, we still have a long way to go to yeah. evolve to that level, advanced level mm -hmm. of, of database. Um, but that said, uh, there are, given how um, you know, storage costs have reduced, right? Mm -hmm. Costs play a big part of it. Um, given, given that uh, uh, the interop is, uh, is important, uh, open formats are, are obviously a, a great thing. Now, if you add to this um, the fact that uh, you can uh, have multiple computes, you, you, you can take some limitations for the time being. We'll evolve over the next few years uh, and get to that state of the art. So uh, a single engine might write data, but within Fabric, multiple engines can read data, and there's still a lot of power to mm. that. Um, and one more thing to add is uh, uh, the interrupt between formats is also becoming really important. Uh, so some, you know, so within a large uh, uh, conglomerate, uh, there's MNAs. Yeah. Uh, one side has Delta, another side has Iceberg. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, and as Microsoft and Azure Data, we want to support all of these. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so that's where the interrupt comes in with. Uh, uh, open source projects like Xtable, which we are founding members of, uh, which allow for uh, movement of uh, uh, these data, uh, these formats, uh, whether it's Delta to Iceberg or Iceberg to Delta or Hoodie. Right? I mean, you can almost dip the and Sanjeev say that performance evolution of the infrastructure might put slow that bridge that gap between performance being the constraint. Okay, if you believe that to be true, then performance will just take care of compatibility issues. So what happens next? And, and then how do you build an architecture around building a global distributed computing architecture that has you know, fully interoperable and heterogeneous data systems together? Is a multiple engines, I mean, we're seeing people say, it's like the database world. Multiple databases is a reality. Multiple engines are reality. So most people don't even know what an engine is. What is a data engine? I mean, well, well, how would yeah. you describe what a data engine is so, for someone who wants to learn? So a data engine is basically a 
purpose-built compute for a certain workload. For example, it could be Azure Data Factory, mm -hmm. which is for ETL. It could be Power BI. I'm, I'm just showing Microsoft yeah, here, absolutely. but it could be Looker. It could be yeah. uh, so. And then, of course, uh, the analytical compute engines get the most uh, most uh, uh, talk, and they are, you know, um, Tableau's of the world, um, uh, Click, and all of those. Uh, but then there's also Spark, which is open source. Yeah. You can use Spark for your ETL, you can use it for visualization, you can use Pandas, you can use the new ones like Ray. So those are the compute engines. And then I would even take it a level further and I would say LLMs become compute engines of the future, mm -hmm. where you have a chatbot, where you ask a natural language query, it goes to an LLM, gets vector embedded, and then it checks the semantic layer to get you the answer. Okay, I need to take a deep breath there, no. <laughs> if, so uh, we always use the term under the hood, mm -hmm. implying there's an engine like a car. Yeah. I bring this up because a lot of people say, how do I architect, I mean, you can compose. Correct. That's why I want to yeah. get at this, what is an engine? Because you have data engines, you talk about compute, uh, semantic layers, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of things going on there. That's right. How do people think about the multiple engine construction of a platform? Yeah. That's yeah. the question on the table. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say fundamentally data is the base la layer, if you will. On top of it, de depending on the kind of workload uh, you want to run, uh, if you want to cleanse the data, transform the data, you could use Spark, right, as an example, and that would be using our lake house within, within Fabric and Notebooks. Uh, if you want to do um, advanced analytics, uh, you could use a warehouse, of course, and now most of these are disaggregated, uh, where you have uh, uh, essentially <laughs> the computes on the top and the, um, as well as the storage layer below. Uh, and you could use uh, time series databases, windowing queries, for example, uh, there's a different engine, Kusto is the engine that we have. Power BI, of course, has uh, analysis services. So depending on the workload, match the right engine. Uh, for, for uh, You don't have to worry about multiple copies of your data because we have a one copy principle within one lake. Um, and within lake, data lakes as well, uh, open formats, uh, you have one copy and you can run multiple engines on top. So, so if I want to run multiple engines, because yes. engines create formats, which right. Yes. So what's the best mechanism? If I want to start from the ground zero, clean sheet of paper. Can I take a stab at it? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so I, let's say I am an organization and I have all kinds of data, log data, transactional data, and I, I so step number one is I bring the data to Ali Gotsi's point, no vendor should own the data, I own it, it's in my account because it's sensitive data and no copies uh, should be made because then I'm perpetuating the data silo problem. So that's step number one, I own the data. Now step number two is depending upon the persona and the use case, I'm going to bring the right compute engine. For example, if it is heavy duty machine learning AI, maybe I will use Databricks. If it is data cleansing or something like that, I have a choice. I could use Fabric, I could use Apache Spark, depending on my cost. Yeah. If I'm doing time series and we have Custo, but if I'm doing, let's say, analytics, and my data is not that big, it's like under 10 gigabytes, maybe I, I want to use DuckDB as, as a way to run my, my very fast analytics at low cost. So I'm at all times, I am making a trade-off between cost and performance. Whichever is a lower cost, I want to go for that. That is a power. And don't forget storage, because some might be optimized for reads and writes are different. Correct. If you're training, that's the different characteristics of the storage. So I guess what you guys are saying is, so training, everything's up in yeah. the air. Gen AI <laughs> changes the nature Correct. of compute, storage, and networking. Correct. Yes. And that's the main thing happening now. Right. And we haven't even talked about AI on top of the yes. platform yet. Correct. <laughs> the yeah. AI show, what are we talking about? Data is AI. <laughs> no, no, but, no, no but, but there's a distinction. The reason why, why uh, Dipti is saying this is because we are talking about table formats. Table formats are inherently structured data. We have not talked about unstructured data. Yeah. That's where training of models and, and the whole gen AI becomes a very big topic. So you, we were talking before you came on camera and I had another conversation earlier in this event is that the, the, the convergence in the neural network from vector in, uh, embeds mm -hmm. is all data. Mm -hmm. Structured now is being yeah. heavily embedded in there, so into a neural network. Explain that, because most people in, think about unstructured being easy to get embeds for, mm -hmm. uh, which is the neural network uh, way to get the neural network set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how do you set up a neural network? I guess if you're now bringing, if the trend is struck, and all data formats are being 
uh, neural networks up. What, what does that mean? I mean, explain the, uh, the aspect of structured, unstructured, all being vector yeah. embedded. So what we're seeing is a combination of structured, semi-structured, and unstructured mm -hmm. data, right? All of this going into the lake. Right. Uh, the structured data is um, uh, open table formats, essentially. Uh, typically, you would build uh, semantic models on top. For example, with Power BI, you have a semantic model. And our co-pilot then operates on that semantic model and is available for uh, natural language questions. Uh, and just using that uh, yeah. uh, uh, approach, you can uh, essentially use uh, English to come up <laughs> with a dashboard, right, instantaneously. Yeah. So that's one approach. For semi-structured and unstructured data, that's where you have the, the models directly operating on top uh, of this data. Uh, and that's where uh, products like Azure AI Search come in, which provide both the vector indexing capabilities directly on this data, but also keyword-based indexing. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a combination, which is very powerful because in some cases you might need one, uh, or and in some cases uh, vector indexing is uh, is more powerful, and it applies an internal ranking and gives the best results back out. So uh, AI search on top of uh, one lake, for example, is one of the patterns uh, that we're also starting to see, uh, and this is using essentially the you know the the chat gpt versions of uh, uh, copilot that that we have so all of this has evolved overnight you know now you have a, a you have structured data you've thrown in your semi structured and unstructured data your vector index is on top of that and now you're building gen ai applications on this stuff and is that benefit about scale because vector index has been around for a while but it's the multitude of formats and scale, right? Is that the main benefit? The retrieval scale is phenomenal? Absolutely. The, there's a couple of uh, different things I want to say here. So there's a traditional operational database, uh, which is kind of the workhorse hmm. in some ways of and the application. And gets no love. Uh, and, and may not get yeah. enough love. Yes. And so <laughs> uh, if you just think about OpenAI and ChatGPT, their main operational database is Cosmos DB. Right? Mm. And uh, messages go in there. There's billions of uh, interactions that actually get tracked in this, right? Um, and, uh, and then on the other hand, we have vector indexing, which most databases have added in. Cosmos DB has vector indexing. Uh, Azure SQL has added vector indexing. Other, other um, databases have added this as well. And that allows for uh, the more sort of unstructured, semi-structured data to get the, the embeddings to be part of the, the Gen AI apps as well. Um, like TomTom, Tom, uh, interactive uh, you know, car uh, entertainment or infotainment nowadays, they have yeah. different words. Uh, they use vector indexing for that in experience. You can talk to the car uh, and uh, you know, you, uh, it, at the end of the day, it's hitting a vector index yeah. uh, that's, that's powering it. We've got two minutes left and, and I think everyone wants to know, how do I get to that spot? Um, and, and I was talking to a group of folks, uh, practitioners recently, um, one was a senior person, one was a mid-range practitioner, one was right out of college, CS degree. And they're all database people. They're all like, I felt like I was asleep and I woke up and I'm in a whole nother world. They're SQL people. <laughs> hmm. Okay, They're doing a lot of stuff, they're ma managing SQL, and they actually don't know what to do next. How do you guys talk to that person out there watching? that says, hey, I'm, a, I'm fluent in data. It could be a BI person. I mean, all these analysts, they've been doing pipelining, ETL, they know all the stuff, but the wave over here is technical. It's a platform. Yes. It's about neural networks. How do they get involved? What can they do from a Microsoft standpoint? What can they do from a career standpoint to saying, okay, I already know data, I know SQL, but I don't want to just be in one swim lane. Yeah. Because now you have new opportunities. How would you talk to these people? Yeah, the so th there is no shortcut here, but <laughs> to experiment. <laughs> I, that's a hard fact. Uh, everybody's learning. We are all learning. In fact, Dipti and I were talking uh, on my podcast a few weeks ago. It, it, it's uh, it's changing so rapidly. Nothing is set in stone, and the only way is for set up a data lake, we play around with data. What do they do? Party with yeah. data? I mean, what do they? <laughs> I mean, what do I so, do? I want to yeah. get my hands I, I think, dirty. I, yeah, it's it's not that hard. You go to let's say you know Hugging Face. You, uh, in Hugging Face, you can uh, get your workspace, you can pick a model, you can start experimenting, writing yeah. your code and, and seeing how it works and then take that knowledge and start applying it to your own data. Yeah. We're going to call it data parties, not hackathons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Party with data. How, how right. would you explain, how can someone get into Microsoft and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm SQL, because you've got Microsoft SQL Server. 
How do they get in? Can they yeah. just stand up something and start playing around? What's the best Absolutely. way for I mean, someone to get gotten, started? It really is easy. Uh, I would say uh, the best place to start would be um, uh, Microsoft Fabric is all SaaS. So you don't have to download, install anything. You actually just go to a web website, uh, get a free trial. We actually have two months free trial uh, and get started. With one product, you get uh, uh, six different offerings and engines. Um, start off with Data Factory, ingest some data in, take a CSV file, simple file, you know, maybe your guest list from <laughs> your last data party, <laughs> ingest it, store it as Delta Parquet, just making it fun here. Yeah. Um, and uh, then with that Delta Parquet on that single copy, um, create a report and, uh, you know, publish a dashboard with Power BI, uh, and then maybe apply, uh, use Copilot and ask it some fun questions. So that would be, you know, it would be a three hour exercise. <laughs> I could pop in all our Cube alumni into a CSV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And get the video files and create agents. <laughs> yeah. Guys, thanks so much. Final point, advice for people building architecture in rooms right now around the world. They're all talking about this. What, we don't want to foreclose the future. We want to create that headroom. I don't want to make a bad call. A lot of intense strategic alignment going on. It's not just Snowflake's Databricks, it's formats. It's, it's, X, right. it's, it's whatever they got to do. What's the advice? I, uh, my, my advice would be for, uh, to be contrarian. I know you love to be contrarian. <laughs> don't worry about AI as such. First go, make sure your data is in the right shape. And if your data house is not in order, then the whole house of cards called generative AI will fall apart. And you'll be out looking for something. So just you'd be looking sure. for work, you'd be fired. Yeah, you know, <laughs> data quality, uh, data catalog, observability, uh, automation of your tasks through data ops, all these things are the foundational building blocks that need to be in place. And then you go into Gen AI. Absolutely. Your advice. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, get started with uh, understanding your data. Your models are going to be as good as your data, right? Hmm. Uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so start off with your data, that's the foundation, um, and uh, build, build from there uh, up. Um, and uh, uh, the good news is you don't have to move data around. You know, you can use mm. uh, shortcutting mechanisms. Uh, replats are hard. So start with a strong partner, ask hard questions of that partner, understand your requirements well, uh, and then uh, future proof, right? Think, yeah. think uh, medium term uh, beyond just the short term. Um, it, uh, these last a while, so, you know. Uh, Dipti, great yeah. to see you. Now a leader, senior leader at Microsoft, uh, former entrepreneur, Sanjeev. Great Thank you. analyst in the industry. Check out, he's got all the data. Check out his podcast, of course, his Cube videos here. SuperCloud 7, we'll be back with more unpacking of the survey of all surveys that we're releasing today, as well as expert commentary on what the next data platform will look like. I'm John Furrier with Palo Alto Studio. We'll be right back.